Over the last three weeks, I've taught you about the Christian family, about Christian growth, about Christian maturity. Last week, we talked about spiritual teenagers. The week before, we talked about spiritual babes. Tonight, we talk about spiritual fathers, fathers of the faith. Now, if right now, you're trying to decide who are fathers of the faith. Be sure of this. You're not one of them. <laughs> Do you want me to say that again? Did you really get that? If right now you're trying to look across this group and think who is a father of the faith, you're not one. Because your eyes are in the wrong place. And I have a feeling, and it's only a feeling, I can't say this for sure. I believe there are very few of us who are fathers of the faith. Very, very few indeed. I think a lot of us are spiritual teenagers for one reason or another. Now, when we shared the subject, first of all, which was March the 17th, I went through the three different groups. And I suggested to you then that the spiritual fathers were different from the other two groups in three particular ways. The spiritual father has died to himself and to his own needs for the sake of the spiritual teenagers and babes. I want to say more about that in a minute. Do you understand that? He's just died to all those things that he cares about for the sake of the family of God. Secondly, he takes on the responsibility of the family of God in the right sense. Seeing himself and by the way, this can be male or female, don't get upset about this, but he sees himself as someone who has a responsibility because of where he is in Jesus, for those who haven't gone as far as he has. And the third thing is, he's moved beyond the formulas that we've talked about of both the babes and the teenagers that don't work anywhere. So let me zero in for a minute on the differences for the fathers of the faith. Unlike the spiritual babes, they're not taken up with the picky details. The spiritual babes can drive you wacky because you're trying to center on the Lord and you're trying to center on His work and you're trying to center on the things that matter and they're bothered about incredible things. Where are the hymn books? Who cares? The babes. The second thing we find in the difference is they never, ever get caught up in gossip. The babes do. So do many of the teenagers. Let me read you a quote that I wrote to some of our folk from James 1.26. This is an incredible verse. Listen. If anyone considers himself spiritual and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself, and his spirituality is worthless. If you as an individual have an uncontrolled tongue, what spirituality you have is useless. Because you've never let the Holy Spirit take control of that very dangerous weapon. And with it, we destroy. You will never find a father of the faith who does that. And one other thing with the babes. For the father of the faith, his horizons are bigger in the family of God. He sees the outreach of Christ. He sees the follow-up pattern. He sees all sorts of things the babe and the teenager never see. But what about the teenagers? Why is the father different there? Because the father has learnt what the teenager hasn't. That the formulas don't work. You remember what we talked about? Listen, brother. If you only had more faith, you would be healed. And then we see a person with faith, and they die. 
or if only you were righteous, this wouldn't have come on you. And then I look at Job, about whom God says he is a righteous man above all men. And look what happened to him. The formulas don't fit. And the father of the faith has learned that. And coming back to what I said just now. He has recognized that the God we worship is the God of infinite variety. And he does 101 different things. And don't ever restrict God by your own little ideas. And a lot of us do. Oh, he can't do that. Why not? Well, I haven't experienced it. That's the teenager. And the third thing there for the teenager, the spiritual father has learnt restraint and self-control in every facet of life. The teenager hasn't. They really haven't. But why else are they different? Well, let's turn to Scripture. And there are a number of reasons I found for the difference with the spiritual fathers. And basically, it's one fact. They have read the Word of God, and they have absorbed the Word of God, and it's become part of them. You will never find a father of the faith who is not absolutely in the Word of God, and the Word of God is in them. It is part of their life. It just flows out. Not that they're quoting scripture, but you see, you observe, in their character, in their personality, and especially in their thinking, they've absorbed the word of God. It's just become part of them. And you will never change your thought patterns. You can't, and nor can I, but the word of God can. And as I absorb what God says, I begin to think like God. That's the Father. Now let me show you from Scripture one or two examples. The first one, and this is beautiful, and a lot of you know this quote. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about love. But he says in verse 11, When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. In the father of the faith, the spiritual childness has gone. Thank God it's gone. You don't have all the nonsense of the spiritual babe. Because they've grown up in Christ and all that stuff, all that junk that can drive a minister wacky has gone. Hallelujah. The fathers of the faith are dealing with other things. They're reaching out with love to other people. They're seeking the next move that God wants to make. Those are the fathers. When I became a spiritual man, I put away these childish things. There's a second thing I found for you, and if you've got your Bible open, it's probably on the same page. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. It says, brothers, meaning sisters as well, stop thinking like children. Spiritually, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants. But in regard to thinking, be adults. Question. How has your mind been changed since you first came to know Jesus Christ? Are you one of these Christian believers who's struggling because you're seeking to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ this way? You have that ethic for your life, but you still think like the world. You can't do it. I can't do it. If my mind is like the world, I have such a problem walking with Jesus. How can I change? Back to the Word of God. There is absolutely no other way I can tell you. Until you take the Word of God and begin to absorb it into your mind, until your thinking changes, until you begin to think like the Lord our God thinks, you're not going anywhere. You can hear those words coming down the centuries. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And a lot of us play at our Christianity because we've never taken the time 
to let the Word of God just penetrate our thinking so we begin to think the way God thinks. We remain as babes, we remain as teenagers. There's a third thought I found, and that's Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. Here is a fantastic verse. It says, and Paul says, Until we all reach unity in the faith, and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Jesus Christ. The spiritual father is moving in the area of the fullness of Jesus Christ. Can you picture that? In every way, in every part of their character, in everything that's coming out of them, they're moving in that fullness of Jesus Christ. But know this, the Lord our God wants this for every one of us sitting here. This isn't for some little select group. He wants you all to become fathers of the faith. He wants me to become a father of the faith. Do you see the steps of growth in this verse? Let's go back. Until we all reach unity in the faith. Friend, if you're out of step with every Christian, be quite sure you've got a problem. We've had someone in Jesus Focus just like this, fantastic to talk to them. This is wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, so-and-so's wrong. And in the end you think, sure there's nothing wrong with you? And the actual fact is, yes there is. There's a negative spirit there that will blow you apart. Everything's wrong. If you're like that, you're so far from Jesus Christ and don't know it. You're nowhere near the Father situation. Because the Father is in unity. Secondly, in the knowledge of the Son of God. And I want to come back on that because that's vital. Thirdly, becoming mature. And fourthly, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? I think this. You mark my words. Every time you see a father of the faith, you'll find they have one thing they seek to do. Glorify Jesus Christ. And take none themselves. Glorify Jesus Christ in their words, in their life, in their prayers, in their sharing with you, in their attitudes, you name it. Glorify Jesus. He is Lord in every sense. A fourth thought comes from Scripture, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14. The writer says, whoever he was, but solid food is for the mature, for who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish between good and evil. The spiritual fathers absorb the strong, deep spiritual concepts, the ideas from the Word of God. The solid food for the Christian believer is this book. There are hundreds and thousands of good Christian books. This is the one you need if you want to be a father of the faith. If you really want to grow in Jesus. You say, Richard, I don't know how to study it. Do you know, in this ministry, we are so blessed. You can go to Anne Petrosky. Now, is the table open tonight, Peggy? Yes. You can go to Peggy Sandal, who will be at the tape table, and you can order teaching tapes by Malcolm Smith and other teachers, and do what I did. Sit down with your tape recorder and your Bible and a notebook, and begin to study the Word of God. Not read it three verses, and then you've had the prescription for the day, and you're cleansed and you're healed and you're on the way. Study it. Absorb it. I will never forget studying the letter to Hebrews, with Malcolm's help. Suddenly, for the first time, I saw the Old Testament in the New Testament in a way I never had before. But I had to sit down and take time. And it's not always easy. But the result is always glorious. They have absorbed these great concepts, these ideas from the Word of God, and it's changing them. Also, of course, and I said this to you last week, 
The person who really becomes mature in Christ is the person who becomes the intercessor. The folk we want to talk to tomorrow. Do you remember what I said to you about the intercessor? It calls for the maturity. For they're the person who lives the love of God to each situation and to each individual. In other words, supposing you are a true intercessor and you get one of these prayer cards. What you do, you lift that person up and you begin to live the love of God to that individual. Do you understand that? That's the intercessor. And the second thing that happens, and this is exciting, you begin to feel the heartbeat of God. You begin to feel it. Paul says to us in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 26, If one part of the body suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. I believe that the true intercessor, the father of the faith, sometimes is beginning to pray for a certain individual, and the next thing is, they're crying. Why are they crying? Because they begin to feel the heartbeat of the Almighty. A little bit of what you were saying, Chris. You begin to feel for the family. And as you are zeroing in, tears begin to run down your face. And you think, what's wrong with me? And your spirit within you is weeping. As the Lord himself is weeping over that individual. For whatever they've done. It's the heartbeat of God. Now the teenager doesn't find that. The babe doesn't find that. But the father of the faith agonizes at times. We think, what's wrong with them? They're feeling what God feels. And sometimes I believe situations happen in the body of Christ and I believe Jesus just stands there weeping. The Father feels that. Because he's been in touch. Why? Because he went where we went tonight, into the very presence of God. Sometimes it hurts. And other times there's hilarious joy. With God. Do you understand that? It's a tremendous experience. Which takes me to a third matter, and that is the key difference in the fathers, the spiritually mature, from anyone else in the Christian church, anyone else in the body of Jesus Christ. When I read to you first of all, I read from 1 John chapter 2. And I read these words about the fathers. And it's interesting because John says the same thing twice. Verse 13. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. You've known him who is from the beginning. Listen. He says again, verse 14. I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. You say, just a minute, John. You're repeating yourself. What are you saying? He says, the fathers of the faith. Know God. They know Him. Now, in that word know, you go right back into the Old Testament concept. It's the relationship of a husband and a wife. They know. It's intimate. It's personal as no other. They know God. Is that where you are? Do you know Him like that? Do you really know Him? We sang tonight, the greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. You want to grow in Christ. You want to become mature in Christ. You will never take a step until you begin to know him. And for the fathers of the faith, they know him who was from the beginning. All right, let's go a step further. They have that personal, intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Let's think of some examples, and there are a lot. In the Old Testament, we'll go back a little bit. Go to Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, if you have your Bible, and have a little look at Enoch. Do you remember him? You say, yes, I remember him well. Well, he lived a few years ago. And it says, Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. And then, Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more. 
because God took him away. That, friend, is knowing God. He walked with God. And had a death that any of us would love. He just kept on walking. Now, because Americans, we'd have to say, Lord, come by car. We'd just keep on driving, right into glory. But isn't that tremendous? Do you feel it? For Enoch, he had such a personal, intimate relationship, he was like Adam before he sinned. He just walked with the God Almighty. But God doesn't just want that for Enoch. He wants it for each and every one of us sitting here tonight so that we can walk with him and he can walk with us. There's a second one, and that's Moses. And I found a lovely one here. Exodus 33 and verse 11. And just the first part of that verse. Exodus 33, 11. And the Bible says, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face. Now, the Old Testament people believed that if you ever saw God, you'd die. But that wasn't true for Moses. He actually sat or stood and he talked with God face to face. A father of the faith. Do you see why Moses was the man he was? I didn't say he didn't ever make a mistake. But he was a father of the faith. He spent time talking to God one on one, face to face. Fantastic. By the way, if you're going to be a father of the faith, you're going to have to take time to spend with God. Or you're never going to make it. There's a third character in the Old Testament. His name is David. And God says of David, he's a man after my own heart. The characteristics of God were in David, and I mentioned some of them last week. What do we see in David that was of God? He trusted. He loved. He was obedient. He repented when he'd done something wrong. So many marks in that man. God says, he's a man after my own heart. He became a father of the faith. What about the New Testament? Well, there's dear old Peter. When I did the brokenness series, I talked about the way God broke Peter, down and down and down and down until he was absolutely nothing. Finally, when he denied his Lord, he goes outside, and I don't know if you can picture this, this great big fisherman just stood there and he wept bitterly because he'd just blown the whole ball game. But then there's a sweet verse on Easter morning. Do you remember Luke 22? The two come back from Emmaus and they enter the upper room and the disciple says, Jesus has appeared to Peter. Isn't that like Jesus? Took him aside. And they just spent time together. What did Jesus do? Restored him. Put him back together again. And who stood up on the day of Pentecost? John? No, Peter. Why? Because he'd been so broken and so emptied, he was now ready to be used. And then I find that he writes to us, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Listen to this. This comes from a father of the faith. Finally, all of you. By the way, he happens to be saying this to us too. Plug in. 1 Peter 3, verse 8. Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. That's not a bad verse. We'll hit verse 9 just to add to it. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Peter beca became a father of the faith, and when he did, he could sit down and write that to us in 1984. There's another father of the faith I love. It's Stephen. He's the first one who was martyred for his faith. And interestingly enough, it says of him in Acts 6 and verse 5, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. You may remember he talked before the Sanhedrin. 
at the end of that speech, because it was a speech, chapter 7, verse 55, it says, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Here was this young man, a father of the faith, dying for Christ. And what does he see? God gives him a vision. He sees heaven open. And in moments he was there. What about the Apostle Paul? Well, some of us have problems with Paul, but you know, whatever you say, when you see what that man went through for the Lord, incredible. Most of us would have died or given up long before. This fellow was as tough as nails. Nearly died, put in prison, beaten. And on and on he went. And isn't it interesting? Someone comes in. Oh, I'm so depressed. What's happened? Well, when what's happened, it's really relatively small. Although some of you are under tremendous tensions. And I understand that. But what about Paul? In the middle of it all, he says, I give thanks unto God who always gives me the victory in my Lord Jesus Christ. Always gives me the victory. You say, Paul, you must be kidding. He says, no, that's true. A father of the faith. And he writes. I read it to you just now and I want to read it again because it's so absolutely incredible. Ephesians 4.13 until we all reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Paul says, my experience over the years has been this. I've just moved in unity. I've moved in knowledge. I've moved into maturity. And I'm into the fullness of Christ. But also, the Father of the faith knows the Father, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ. In Philippians 3 verse 10, Paul says this, I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. In knowing him, I see the father of the faith lives a consistent life. Do you hear that? Consistent. Not up and down. You know how some of the teenagers are and some of the babies. How are you today? Oh. Next time you say, how are you today? Oh, great! And they're flying around the ceiling. And a father of the faith comes in, and they've got that consistency of living. Not up and down, up and down. The yo yo Christian. That's not true of the father of the faith. Because they've absorbed the word, and they're on an even keel. There's a second thing in Philippians 3, and it's in verse 8. And Paul says this. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. I consider everything as loss. What for? To know Jesus. What are you giving up, Paul? Money? Marriage? Obviously moving right up the tree of success. A young up-and-coming Pharisee, obviously heading for the top in the Sanhedrin. He says, I've given it all up. Friend, what are you willing to give up to become mature in Jesus Christ? Will you give up position? Will you give up home? Will you give up everything you've got? He says, I count it all as rubbish. I count it all as dung. I count it all as refuse. To know Jesus. To know Jesus. To have that intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul says that's all that matters. And you understand what I'm going to say now. The spiritual father, the father of the faith, shows their knowledge of God by the lives they lead. You don't have to ask them to write it. You see it. You feel it. You hear it. First, their eyes and their thoughts are on Him. They're on Him. They're not ignoring people, but they're seeing the true issues, the true concerns. And when I began to look at this, the first thing I see is, they become like Christ. And secondly, they begin to be controlled by the Holy Spirit in all their ways, directed by Him.
It's a spirit-controlled life. I see they take time to be alone with the Heavenly Father. Alone with God. And the fourth thing I find is, they are praying people. You can go to them and know they're going to pray. The second thing I see, this knowledge that they have of Christ comes out in their lives because the fruit of the Spirit is constantly showing. You see the love, the joy, the peace because they've spent time alone. You know, we're going through the stories of Easter and here's Jesus in the temple. And first one group gets him and then another group gets him and then a third group gets him and a fourth group gets him. And as we saw last night, there stands Jesus. Control, master of the situation. Why? Because he took time to be alone with the Father, to commune. And what happens to us? We get into a crisis in life and we don't know which way to turn and we don't know what to do. Why? We've never been alone with the Father. And everything falls apart. We say, I don't know what's wrong with my Christian life. You don't spend time with Father. Oh, I don't have time. Jesus didn't sleep. He went off and spent part of the night alone with Father. Oh, but you don't understand my chemistry. I have to have eight hours a night. Nonsense. <laughs> Some doctor told you that, bless his heart. The other thing, and this is beautiful, I see in the fathers of the faith, they have a Christ-like gentleness and humility. Friend, you've never become like Jesus until you've buried your pride at the foot of the cross. You have no rights in Jesus. You surrender them all to him. And if, as I say that, you feel something rise up in you, who do you think he is? You just lost it. You just lost it. Now, having said that they're gentle and they're humble, but they're still wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The fathers of the faith are not dumb Christians. They're very aware in the Holy Spirit of what's going on. They're very aware when you're playing games and I'm playing games. Because they're in touch with the Father. But there's a gentleness there. And there's a humility. And we cannot have Christ-likeness if we don't have humility. It was Jesus, not Peter or John or Matthew, who got up from the table and washed the disciples' feet and said... Now you go and do as I have done. Hmm. Do you think I'd wash your feet? Well, do you think I'd let you? <laughs> and both have lost the ball game. No humility. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be a father of the faith? I know this. And I said it to you the last weeks. I get more and more convinced Jesus by his spirit has brought us together in Jesus' focus. And others too. That we can all become fathers of the faith. Not just some little select hierarchical group. That is absolutely bad theology. I believe he wants every one of us to move into maturity in Christ, to know Christ, to glorify Christ in all that we do, to find that situation where it doesn't matter about Richard and it doesn't matter about so-and-so. What matters is Jesus. And when we come to that point, when we give up all this other nonsense that is absolute self, then, friend, we'll move into the fatherhood that God wants us to have. And I believe I can almost see Jesus weeping over some of you because you won't give up your baby ways, you won't give up your teenage ways, you won't get alone with Father, and you don't grow. Let's pray.
Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, speak to us individually. We're so different. We're at different points in our walk in faith. But Jesus, you want us to mature. Let us hear you speaking now and no one else. And we say thank you.